conditional arguments and argument forms are central to logic and central to critical thinking more broadly. You absolutely must know the basic valid and invalid argument forms that use the conditional. So here goes. We'll start with the most basic valid form known as modus ponens. This is modus ponens. If you've watched the tutorials in the basic concepts course, then you've seen a number of examples of this argument form already. The term modus ponens is another holdover from the days when logic was taught in universities during the Middle Ages, and the language of instruction was Latin. So we have all these Latin names for argument forms and fallacies that people still use. The full Latin name is modus ponendo ponens, which means something like the mode of affirming by affirming. It refers to the fact that with this conditional form, we're affirming the consequent by affirming the antecedent. But everyone today just calls it modus ponens. Here's an example. If your king is in checkmate, then you've lost the game. Your king is in checkmate, therefore, you've lost the game. The conditional premise asserts that if the antecedent is true, then the consequent is true. The second premise affirms that the antecedent is in fact true, and you then validly infer that the consequent must also be true. Now, if you've watched the tutorials in the propositional logic course, then you know that there are lots of different ways of writing conditionals. As long as the conditional premise is equivalent in meaning to the one you see here, the argument will be an instance of modus ponens. For example, you might write the conditional as, you've lost the game unless your king is not in checkmate. As we showed in the propositional logic course, this is an equivalent way of saying, if your king is in checkmate, then you've lost the game. If you're not sure why this is so, and you're curious, then you might want to check out that course. But the point I want to make here is that this argument has the same logical form as the previous version. It's an instance of modus ponens, even though it doesn't use the if a then b syntax to express the conditional. What matters is that the claim is logically equivalent to a conditional of the form if a then b. So when we say that an argument has the form of modus ponens, we're not saying that it's necessarily written in the form if a then b, a therefore b. We're saying that it's logically equivalent to an argument of that form. This is why knowing those translation rules for conditionals is important. They can help you see past the superficial grammar and into the underlying logical structure of a conditional argument. I'd like to finish with a point that is important for all of the conditional argument forms we'll be looking at. You see the conditional form I've written above. I've replaced the antecedent and the consequent with negations throughout the argument. The point I want to make is that this argument is still an instance of modus ponens, even with those negation signs. It's equivalent to the standard form with the obvious substitutions. The antecedent of the argument on the right isn't p, it's not p, and the consequent isn't q, it's not q. In fact, you can have long, complex compound claims playing the role of the antecedent and the consequent, and as long as they're related in the right way, they'll still be instances of modus ponens. Here's an example. If I get an A in Spanish and don't fail French, then I'll graduate this year. I got an A in Spanish and it didn't fail French, therefore I'll graduate this year. This is just modus ponens. The antecedent in this case has some structure to it. It's a compound claim, a conjunction. I got an A in Spanish and I don't fail French. It's important when analyzing conditional arguments to understand that conditional claims can have complex parts to them and still be equivalent to a simple conditional of the form if A then B.